problem with this slide for, for addiction. So here in the tobacco, uh, I'm a psych psychiatrist and addiction specialist, and here in the tobacco cessation outpatient clinic, we treat approximately 400 to 600 patients a year suffering from tobacco. So first of all, my uh, conflicts of interest. Well, uh, well, I have uh, I have some some money from pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I have a very fruitful relationship with the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment. This is the Bundesamt für Risikobewertung, uh, and some data from this uh, I will share you uh, in the next sec in the next minutes. But, ladies and gentlemen, I have no context with the tobacco industry or cigarette manufacturers or distributors. Really, no. They tried it, but I have no contact with them. So, I made a commitment to show this slide at every talk this year, so it needs to its end, but now I think sometimes I have to show it this year. Uh, a full airplane of people die every day from tobacco smoking. Yes, this is here uh, in Germany, 320. Uh, this is a Boeing 747 dying from smoking every day. And if you go to Austria, still the airplane is smaller, but it's still a full airplane, 88 people a day. Or in Switzerland, 26 people a day. So smoking is a disease that kills people. And we are here to do something against it. Uh, my presentation is about the addiction potential of nicotine. At the beginning, I would like to say a word about addiction, the uh, addiction potential in general. Uh, you see this famous, uh, pub, uh, this famous publication from uh, this just a second. This famous publication from Nut, at all uh, Nut, and. Um, uh, all legal and illegal addictive substances were once compared and classified with each other by many, many experts. And as you see here, the classification was made according to pleasure, psychological dependence, and physical dependence. And as Professor Meyer said, this is really true. The most important thing in smoking is the psychological dependence. You see, it's 2.6. It's almost heroin, cocaine. But we have a mixture of physical and psychological dependence. And you see here, the physical dependence of tobacco is high, even high. It's higher than most of the drugs here. So tobacco, in general, tobacco smoke ranks in third addiction potential of all known drugs. So, and the strong physical dependence on tobacco smoke is mainly caused by nicotine. You are quite right, Professor Meyer. There are other things, monamine oxidase, but the most important target, the most important thing in the physical addiction of cigarettes is nicotine. Well, this common combination is usual. You know it all. But what is the situation now, what is the situation now with the new inhalation forms of nicotine? Perhaps this combination this combination is unusual something must be different here but why don't we see this combination well there is an explanation for this one of the most important knowledge for addiction specialists is that the addictive potential of drug of a drug correlates with the speed of its influx into the arterial arterial blood and you know all the nicotine from a combustion cigarette reaches the brain within 20 seconds. I, you know, you breathe in and in a, within 20 seconds, you have bong, the nicotine flash in your brain. And in the case of the e-cigarette model I showed you earlier, I showed earlier, for example, here, this inflation, this inflation, this influx, the speed of this influx is very slow. This means that this espresso is already drunk before a connection with a nicotine from the e-cigarette can be developed. That's the point. So this leads us, this brings us to our studies and the data, I, uh, our data I want, uh, I want to share with you. Though the nicotide studies are from a very fruitful work, from our working group and a very fruitful uh, collaboration with the BFR, the German uh, Federal Institute for Risk Assessment, uh, Deutsches Bundesinstitut für Risikobewertung. We do the nicotide studies. 
and we test it and we are testing different delivery methods we tested tank models joule sigalikes. likes we test are testing ongoing heated tobacco products nicotine pouches and all in all these products we are interested in nicotine delivery the inflation the user and subjective effects for example on craving well the aim uh, of all these nicotine studies i think we have four or five now running uh, uh, is a comparison of products so for the consumption of one unit uh, with a puffing regime or uh, uh, at libitum consumption um, the target group are experienced users of alternative nicotine delivery systems ands or cigarette smokers but we can't do tests on non-smokers because this is not ethical but it would be very interesting so we started some years ago 2018 with the munich israel study we investigated three different nicotine, uh, nicotine delivery methods, the standard e-cigarette, the tank, uh, a small tank model, which was very famous at this time, and cigar uh, like What did we do? In our setup, at very short intervals, we tested the nicotine blood concentration every minute in the first 10 minutes from the smokers or vapors. And our smokers or vapors had a very strict puff regime every half they were required to make a puff every half a minute so this is the if you if you if, if you want this is the nicotide study a basic setup with all these things we do then so what did we find what did we find uh as we as expected we found a very fast nicotine influx uh, for the tobacco cigarette, as published before, followed by a slower influx from the tank model and a very, very slow, slow, inf slower influx of the um, uh, cigar like. And you see uh, very low nicotine concentrations in the venous blood. And um, we saw, we, we saw. Uh, uh, similar similar uh, uh, influences on craving by the way so with this data we concluded that all the e-cigarettes we tested have a lower dependence potential so can this data show the nicotine uh, uh, show need to uh, an answer some questions perhaps one question why why the, uh, or answer the question why do the people don't start with e-cigarettes because in 2014, we already published that only 0.2 to 2% of uh, e-cigarette users are never smokers. And the current data does not say much different. So we will hear something about the gateway hypothesis later on. I'm very keen on it and it should be very, it's very interesting. But for now, uh, our explanation was that the e-cigarettes are not don't have such an addictive potential but then something changed we had the largest increase in nicotine use among school children since 1975 what happened you all know Joule came along and Joule is in a very stylish design an e-cigarette a pot model and uh, with very high nicotine dosages in the dosages in the US market 60 milligram per milliliter and uh, you learned something about uh, dosages uh, from Professor Meyer and what they did they had a nicotine salt formulation and well I'm not a chemist Professor Meyer perhaps you they put it to an ideal pH my specialty is addiction medicine but let me show you my impression they made a formulation formulation to optimize nicotine influx and to minimize irritation like this here ha this is what they did and well they did they they did good but because they did well because you see here uh, if you remind the graphs from our studies uh, you can see this is from the company you see here uh, the nicotine influx from the conventional cigarette and here you see jewel it's almost it's very very similar uh, compared to a conventional e-cigarette 
So perhaps that could be, this could be a, an, an explanation uh, uh, why it was so successful even in, in young people. But Joule was a flop in EU. They have failed. They are not longer, at least on the German market. What happened? We had the European regulation and we have 20 milligram per milliliter allowed. And this was too low. Well, this was too low. In our labs, in the nicotide area, we also examined the German Joule and saw quite different results uh, compared to the American uh, version whose data I showed you before. You see here the tobacco cigarette, the initial new, and then the manufacturers have tried to modify their product in Europe, but, they, but we have been able to show in our studies, which we published here re recently, that this has not much more improvement in the speed of nicotine influx. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Joule story is, my, in my opinion, an example of the fact that the nicotine flow rate and the nicotine concentration play a very important role in addiction. So, ladies and gentlemen, so much for nicotine and dependence potential, but I would like to say a few general words about e-cigarettes and new nicotine inhalation products in two minutes, and I would share my thoughts with you on the basis of a drama. And the drama, which is mandatory reading for German high school children, is Wolfgang, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Faust. And the drama with the e-cigarettes, is it a thriller? Is it a tragedy? We will see. First of all, we have a look at the protagonists. There is Mephistopheles. Mephistopheles, the evil. I think here in our drama, it's the tobacco industry. They have an ideal, ideal, deadly consumer product. They have gigantic cells. They have new products. They, in, they are in great fear of tobacco control policy and they employ dubious methods. I think we all know that. This is the evil. Then we have God. God, well, I call them pneumologists, cancer physicians, and abstinence oriented, this is from me, nicotine activists. I think you know what I mean. Well, they are very nice people. They know, they think everything that harms must go. They believe that smoking is more a vice, more of a vice than an addiction. Uh, they think addictive substances are always evil. We know, well, they always want to help patients. Yeah. Uh, well, they're really dedicated, well-meaning people. They have good intention. They are good. They are good here, but sometimes a little far from the real world. And then Dr. Faustus. That's addiction physicians, public health experts, general practice, and ladies and gentlemen, I think most of us here. We know about patients, we see epidemiology, we do research fine, we know how to read studies, we know about addiction, we know about risk assessment. Are we good, are we bad? The final slices are, slides are the crucial questions, die Gretchenfrage. The first crucial question is, how harmful is it? How harmful are these new products? Well, the simple answer is, all new forms of consumption are less harmful compared with tobacco smoking. That's for sure. You can, we, we can talk hours and hours, but this is the answer. The next crucial question is number two. Can you stop smoking with it? Well, the answer, the current answer is probably yes. We have large studies, we have a Cochrane review. Well, there's a new publication, JAMA Open, a cohort study from John Pierce. But well, probably yes. It, everything looks like that you can, and yeah, you, you had the first talk, you can. This is my opinion. But the data says the same. So if you're now keen in uh, Faust and you look in the internet, you find this in Wikipedia, you know all these protagonists are connected. And with my last slide, I will show you that it's the same here with us. So we have the smoker, we have the tobacco industry, it's the evil, it's the evil. Uh, we have the pneumologists, the nicotine activists, and we have us. And now we are all connected and we are all, all actors are connected. The smoker gives much money to the tobacco industry, 30,000 euros um, a, a, a li in lifetime. And they give him advertising, suffering, death, 
and new products. And the tobacco industry gives us scattering doubts, study results, questionable study results, advertising, and sometimes they give money to them and to them. They tried it with me, I am not sure. Nobody talks about it, but I think they do it. Well, the nicotine activists say quit or die to the smokers. We say, well, there is a risk reduction, they have a cessation poten potential, anything is better than continuing to smoke. But the main problem is, unfortunately, we have, these we have these conflicts. We do presentations, statements, studies, positions that are not helpful on this cause, and we need to talk about that. So let me finish. Tobacco dependence. Tobacco dependence is a life-threatening illness. Nicotine plays an important role in addiction. The speed of influence, influx is crucial here. And watch out for the tobacco industry and their new products, but do not demonize them. We need more courage and innovation. Thank you and thanks for my team and for the Bundesamt für Risikobewerkung for this excellent cooperation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tobias, uh, for this very interesting uh, talk and very well illustrated. Um, yeah, are there any questions in the chat? Um, uh, Frank Henkler-Stefani is asking, how does the American Juul perform in the Fagerström test compared with tobacco cigarettes? Well, the, the first thing is that we have, we still have a, a, a validated uh, instrument like the Fagerström test for e-cigarettes. There are some trials, we did it too. And there is a, there is a addiction. We I don't have uh, uh, so because we we don't we, we don't we had, we don't uh, uh, examine children, so we don't know what it is. What I heard is that there is a there is a dependence like cigarettes in uh, with the American jewel. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, more a comment than a question. A famous um, PT study showed that it takes several minutes until nicotine from cigarette smoking arrives in the brain. The 20 seconds are a myth. The rapid kick of smokers is certainly not caused by nicotine. This is very interesting, but I don't, I don't believe it. Please okay. show me your data, but I, because I know my data, <laughs> which I did in my lab. So no problem. Can I, can I make a comment? I don't please, know. Please, sure. Yes. Okay, so this was a very nice study published in PNS in your study confirms that your E6 study it was minutes, not, not 20 seconds. Yes, sure. Yeah, it, it takes a while until it's in the blood and it takes a while. This was my question actually. And it takes a while until it's in the brain. So this was an excellent talk as always from you, of course, but allow me to disagree with respect to nicotine addiction. I think even with the Jew and with the high nicotine concentration that is more accepted than the low. As we heard in the first presentation, Smokers or former smokers need, they want their nicotine because it has pleasure, pleasure effects like drinking coffee. I think you confuse this with addiction. This is not just because the jewel with high nicotine is accepted while the jewel with low nicotine is not accepted. That doesn't mean that the nicotine is addictive. That just means that smokers enjoy nicotine. Mm -hmm. Like sugar. That's the same thing I say. I call it addiction. You you you, <laughs> you, okay. you call it enjoy. Yes, uh, okay. but they, they can't. Addiction. But the thing is, they can't live without it. And if you go according to ECD ten, yeah, we, we, whereas addiction, then you have you have the rates for addiction. You have from from nine points, you have seven or six. So that's what we do. So in the in the meaning of the ECD ten, we have an addiction, but. I'm absolutely with you. Okay. It's the same with nicotine, uh, with caffeine. There can be a caffeine addiction uh, according to ECD 10 too. But well, we psychiatrists have our medicine. That's okay. fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't uh, discuss, don't let us discuss ICD 10 or DSM 5 or so. Okay. Uh, there are no more uh, questions in the chat. Um, 
um, just uh, that Bernd Meyer said that please don't confound arterial blood measure with the venous measure. The 20 second versus minutes is due to the method of measuring it. Yes, we would we would really like to do the arterial thing, but we had problem with the ethics committee and problem to find uh, patients for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Professor Meyer, would you like yeah, when you inhale when you inhale nicotine, the first site where it gets to is the venous blood and not the arterial. I mean, this is basic physiology. The first thing is the lung arterial. It's the lung, yeah. Yeah, and then the venous blood. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the brain arterials, and then the venous blood. But if you measure it, you, you first see the venous blood. That's true. There's a question from Mr. Nussbaum. Uh, das Bundesamt für Risikobewertung, um, the, the German uh, key institution for risk, uh, uh, for risk assessment, claimed that Juul successfully manipulated their European device to reach nicotine release levels like the US product. You could not confirm these results, correct? Yes, but I think we had a problem in the study design. We had to wait longer. Uh, we just had the first 10 minutes and we had, uh, I think, uh, perhaps it's a, it's a matter of time, and after 20 minutes or uh, half an hour, perhaps it, it changes. This is a well. Thanks, Professor uh, Dr. Nussbaum. He is from British American Tobacco, but sometimes they tell the truth. Okay, then uh, Elisabeth Glitzner. Um, she's from the Medical Tribune, Switzerland. Um, I've known several people who lower their nicotine levels gradually and eventually quit vaping after they feel. Uh, they aren't at risk of relapsing to smoking. I find the nicotine helps my ADHD. I would probably vape for the rest of my life. Yes. Would you like to comment that? So don't misunderstand uh, me. I, together with, Prof with Professor Meyer, that nicotine isn't nicotine isn't the problem at all in the whole field of smoking, vaping, all these things. Mm -hmm. All the other components are the problem. The, the, the smokers die from the toxins and from the burning products, but not from the nicotine. Mm -hmm. And if you have lifelong a nicotine concentration from 20 milligrams per milliliter in your blood, I think you get 100 years and older. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last question from Elisabeth Glitzner. Uh, do people who want to get rid of smoking with e-cigarettes, in your experience, plan to stop vaping afterwards too? Or do they anyway plan on going uh, on with the e-cigarette? I think What's this is the same. I, I didn't understand the, the question. The question was, uh, if according to your experience, uh, do people who want to get rid of smoking, who are your clients, uh, with uh, with e-cigarettes and do they plan to stop uh, vaping afterwards or do they plan to go on with e-cigarettes well most of them most of them plan to stop everything but our uh, but 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 we think okay the first of all is to stop smoking and if you and to switch to to nothing or to an e-cigarette to a very less harmful thing and then of course e-cigarettes aren't healthy at all there's propylene glycol there's all these things in it and you have to stop it sometime but the the biggest step is done then that's what we tell, tell them oh <laughs> <laughs> okay 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 good thank you very much uh, once again tobias uh, for the answers um we now have a short break until uh, 20 past three, and then we will restart uh, with Thomas here.